Log Talk Radio. Welcome to Boxes Pearls. I'm your host, Chrissy McMahon, coming to you live from both Bristol, Pennsylvania, and from England, where we will speak to Magenta Pixie, intuitive consultant and channel. Her moniker is They Say United We Stand, Divided We Fall. It is time for light workers, mediums, researchers, scientists, and all those with differing perspectives on 2012 Earth Changes to come together as a collective force, bringing forward their knowledge and share information and harness that amazing life force energy that is magnified so brilliantly when we we are all together. Um, Magenta has been receiving channeled information from a collective energy who presents as nine-winged beings since 1993. They speak of many clues left for us everywhere and that the journey towards ascension is akin to a cosmic treasure hunt, and that we left clues for ourselves. The clues are throughout history, in architecture, art, music, literature, mathematics, science, religion, television programs, and films, and many more places. And with that, I will bring us to Magenta. Thank you, Magenta, for, Magenta, for attending. Um, Would you like to share a little bit with the audience about yourself? Hello, Chrissy. Thank you for inviting me on your show. Um, Well, yes, I think your introduction is uh, spot on. Um, I'll just say hello to Javanda, who's there in the chat room. Hello, Javanda. Um, Yes, I, I suppose I didn't really start receiving messages as a child, but I always had... Um, knowings of things and clairvoyant happenings going on right from when I was little and I could kind of communicate with fairies and and all sorts and I knew that um, when I was seven years old I knew that uh, I had been in another body and I that I had been telepathic I had memories of being able to move objects with my mind when I was seven years old and I was very frustrated that I couldn't do it anymore and I remember thinking why can't I do it anymore so obviously those memories of being in a um, another reality was with me from very young um, but it wasn't until um, 1993 that I decided to consciously um, move into channeling and so at that time I I uh, got a, a little book which kind of fell out um, from the bookshelf in the bookshop as they do when their books are something you need to read kind of fell out and right at my feet and it was called channeling and it was about a meditation to meet your spirit guide and I went through this this process it took several weeks actually to actually connect with my uh, spirit guide which was one presented as one being at that time and um, I started receiving messages about this these changes that were going to be taking place on our planet more or less straight away but I as a beginner I was very um shocked at the messages I was getting and thought perhaps I was just, you know, a bit crazy. And But it wasn't until I got led to more books and more people that I realized other people were talking about these same things. And I read The Bringers of the Dawn um, by Barbara Marciniak, which was a, a lifesaver for me because I then realized that the message I, messages I was getting were in line with the same thing as other people were getting. So these messages have been coming since 1993, um, but they haven't stayed with me constantly the whole time. Because it's now 2011. Obviously, I was expecting. I was never given a date for when these changes would occur, and I didn't really know what was happening. I knew it was something significant, and that, that the Earth was changing, and that we would be kind of back home, as it were. And I knew that I'd be returning to this kind of telepathic state that I'd always remembered from being a child. 
but I expected it to happen really quickly. I mean, I thought, you know, six months. Um, so I was really getting prepared for it to happen. And I know now that lots of people, I think, who had these knowings back then probably felt the same way. But um, my spirit guide at the time presented as a uh, Zulu warrior, and he told me his name was White Spirit. He was a fifth dimensional entity. I now know that the nine are an evolved version of him. Um, who are nine white-winged beings and are a collective from sixth, seventh density, but he was a fifth-dimensional entity. And he told me that what I was going through was a rehearsal for the real thing, and this wasn't the real time that this was happening. It was definitely going to happen in my lifetime, but it wasn't now. This was a rehearsal, and everything I was experiencing, all this synchronicity and this, this wonderful awakening this was like a rehearsal and it would all happen again. And I think they used the word rehearsal because at the time I was into amateur dramatics. So I, I knew what, you know, a dress rehearsal was like. So this was like the dress rehearsal. And I expected the real show to be very soon. And when it didn't come, um, I kind of, I didn't think I shut the channeling off. But I I kind of lost interest in the whole ascension um, thing. And I thought perhaps I was just a little bit mad and, you know, a couple of years later, I used to say to my brother, who was also with me through this process, I used to say, weren't we crazy a couple of years ago thinking about this? We were going to ascend into some other kind of light being and, you know, nothing's happened and it's the same old earth. And and although they were always there and I did readings and used tarot cards and they were there very much for me in my own personal life, nothing more was really said about this change that was occurring until 2008 and they came through one day, and I'd been talking to them a lot about a personal issue and, and all sorts of things. So I was getting information about lots of stuff, but not about this ascension process. And in 2008, they said, do you, and by this time I'm with the nine, um, do you remember when we told you that, that, that you know what you went through back then in that summer was a rehearsal? I'm like, yes. Well, now it's the real time. Now it's showtime. I'm like, what? Really? No way. Oh, what do I do? And they're like, calm down, stay grounded, remember your training. Are you are, are you going to work as a conduit for us? We need, you know, we need you to be to put all your training into process now. Everything that you have learnt as a student, training time is now moving into work time. It's time to go public. I mean, I was quite freaked out by this because I hadn't really had any warning. They'd never told me go public. I didn't know what another thing meant. Um, uh, I'm sort of saying, what do you mean go public? And they told me about this great gathering that was taking place, that um, many people on this planet had gone through a very similar journey to me, that they had been very um, alone with this, very private with this, and that, that now was the time when they were all coming together and gathering and having this huge ceremony, and they were creating this whole process. And that there were those who were, were going through the whole process a situation that I went through in 93, these younger, newly awakened ones that were here to do such an important job, these indigos, these crystals, and that, that those that had already known about all this would be teaching them and leading them and, and showing them the way. And I just said, well, where is this gathering? I'm thinking, how do I get there? You know, this is a whole planetary thing. I mean, I can't possibly meet anyone over the planet. I was incredibly naive. I hadn't been online long. And they pointed to the internet and I thought, ah, oh, it's online. So that is when I started to um, hunt around for people who might be like me. I'd never even looked for light worker groups or anything until 2008. And I found the lightworkers.org group and joined there. Um, but nothing, I, I still didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. And it wasn't until... But at that time, my, my boyfriend was really into making films for YouTube, and so was my brother. They were always getting together, really annoying me, actually, with their cameras yeah. right in my way while I'm trying to do my housework and look after my children, and they're all out with their cameras and, you know, say hi for the camera, and I'm like, leave me alone. And I remember turning to them one day, and I said, do you know something? One of you two, I don't know which one it is, one of you two is actually going to get quite well known through YouTube I think YouTube is going to be a platform for you in some way uh, I, I don't know which one of you it is but never did I think for a second it would be me and of course now it, it's kind of me that's 
well known on YouTube and had subscribers and I think my boyfriend and brother are a bit jealous of the amount of subscribers I've got and they haven't really got anywhere near that amount but it's not about that but um so yeah my boyfriend was saying would you write a script because I've done creative writing I'd finished my course will you write a script and me and your brother can do a play and I really wasn't too interested in doing that and he kept going on and on about doing something for YouTube and it wasn't until I saw Rice's material Rice of Five on YouTube and heard his, I'd found his material through searching around for sort of um, light worker, way shower, starseed type information. And I thought Risa was just amazing. I really did. And But I thought, you know, I can do something like this, similar. I could make a video and bring my messages forward. Um, I know I'm not the same as Risa, but I could do something kind of similar. And I, I remember speaking to the nine, is this what I'm supposed to do? But they would never really say yes or no. I just got a kind of a smile. So I then said to my boyfriend, look, if I start um, releasing some of my channeling, could you make a video to that perhaps? And, you know, I'll make a new YouTube channel. I don't really know if anyone will be interested, but there's this guy, Reiser, and, you know, he's doing a similar thing. And I, I have messages that are in alignment with this in a different way. I know it's not really a play, a, a screenplay like you asked for, but what do you think? He's, yeah, do it. And so that's what I did. I released the first message on YouTube in 2008 and was very surprised when I got subscribers immediately and people writing to me about my first video. And then the messages just went bang and they were just coming on a daily basis. I mean, I just couldn't really sort of sit down for five minutes without, you know, another download, another message. Everything I looked at keyed me in to these messages. Um, and, well... The rest is history, as they say, and now it's 2011. <laughs> so, <laughs> how lovely! That's a wonderful story, and I'm so fascinated because it was around 2005, 2006 when I started feeling like I was losing my mind, and it wasn't until about 2008, 2007 that I actually found my first UFO paranormal group and was free to talk about all the things I had been learning up until that point. Now, I hadn't had any channeling experiences and haven't seen any entities up until this point. Hopefully that I will soon. But um, I had uh, culminated so much information about what's going on on the planet that um, there wasn't really anybody I could talk to. So it's so fascinating that in 2007, 2008, really was around the time that I, too, realized that we had to start building community. And I know that was given to me intuitively. It wasn't something that I just came up with um, as I'm starting to learn that. So as I was listening to you share about your wonderful uh, beginnings uh, into this whole process, it just gave me some validation. So I want to thank you. Um, maybe there is some cosmic reason besides the, the distilled liquids that I would like to talk to as well. Um, I'm not sure where to go from here. Um, I'm so um, happy that you're here with us today. And uh, I, there's so many wonderful people in the chat. You have to see the wonderful messages that they're leaving. They're absolutely beautiful, and they're highlighting your YouTubes. I believe that they would be your YouTubes. And um, also, I wanted to give the telephone number for people who'd like to call in if you have any questions. The number is uh, 347. Let me check, double check and make sure. 347 637 one eight three two. Um three four seven six three seven one eight three two if you like to call in. Uh we'd like to have phone calls too if you like to talk to us. Okay, um with that said, um I know you have videos on information about the chakras and you also made a video about the ascension which uh talked briefly about the pineal gland. Which one would you like to go into first? Magenta. Well, um, whichever one you, you would like to go into, really, I'd just like to say, actually, when you said, um, I haven't received anything through channeling yet or seen any beings, but hopefully I will, I, I got a yes straight away for you. So, you know, that's that's going to happen, I feel, with you, um, definitely. But, um, you know, wherever you'd like to go, really, I'll, I'll just answer um, anything you want to know as as best as I possibly can. So, wherever you'd like to go, okay. really. Wonderful. So I'm not very familiar with the chakras, and uh, a friend of mine has offered to help me with some 
pranic breathing so that I can get more aligned. Maybe you could explain a little bit about the chakra process and uh, why it's important to have this alignment or how does it uh, correlate to 2012? What do we need to know about the chakras? Because I know that you talk a lot about that. Yes. Well, um, I haven't done too much research on the chakras. Everything I have is really from the nine on that. Uh, Obviously, some subjects I research myself. Other subjects, it's just something I've discussed with the nine. I um, have become quite familiar with the chakras over the last year because in, in the last year I've been doing private consultations with clients. And so one of the things I do is chakra readings and looking at all the chakras to see if they are in alignment um, and balanced and flowing. So what I get from the nine here is we have an energy body around our body, which we many know as the aura, the energetic system. Um, now, the standard um, teaching is that there are seven chakras and seven energy bodies. I think that that model is correct, and I do feel from the nine that that's right. However, I'm also getting from the nine that there are nine chakras and nine en- energy bodies as well. That's also a correct model. So I didn't really understand that myself, but there are two models okay. here. One is the standard model that you will find when you do research into the chakra system. You'll get seven and seven. The nine tell me there's, a, there's nine as well. Not really uh, familiar. I haven't really discussed with the nine too much about the differences. So we'll go with the, the seven model, which is the most known. So you have um, the chakras are connected to the aura, to the energy system, but they are also energy points that are also um, aligning the seven energy bodies and the physical body. So they actually do have a physical counterpart to them. Um, they they mirror the earth energetic system. The earth has chakras. Um, different places on the earth have chakras. The cosmos has chakras. The other planets have chakras. So we we mirror the the cosmic energetic. And our chakras we have the crown chakra above our head, um, which is the chakra that is normally depicted by the color white. Um, and this is the chakra that uh, receives messages from the cosmos. We have the third eye, which is normally depicted as um, dark blue, um, I believe. (laughs) I could be wrong. It could be actually as indigo. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, And that is the, um, depicts the sort of uh, cosmic eye, the, the psychic sight, and also is parallel to the pineal gland. When I do readings uh, for my clients, that that chakra is also very much for the intelligence, the intellect, the focus, um, and I can see lots of color. I see yellow around that as well, even though that's depicted by dark blue or indigo. Yellow is this intelligence color, and that's all in there when I do readings, but that's not necessarily in the standard model. And then you have the, the um, throat chakra, uh, which I think is depicted by pale blue um and when i do readings if that chakra is laid is pushed back a little bit and is smaller than the other chakras that would mean to me that that person is not speaking how uh, they need to they're not saying the things that they need to say perhaps um something's being repressed in their language it could also mean that there's a throat infection um so it's connected to all the bodies here and we can really look at the physical body through the chakra system we have the heart chakra which is depicted by green i also see the heart chakra as pink as well but it's it's predominantly depicted by green this will tell me if the person is um a po- polarized service to others being is predominantly embracing love if the heart chakra is guarded by um, like a a sort of a a cage but with um, uh, sort of air going into it then that person has still got an awakened heart chakra but they're guarding it if it's got a completely um, covered cage over it then they're shutting the, the heart chakra off Heart chakras can sometimes be too big, which means they're, they're too much love and light and, and not balancing that with, with the rest of the, the system. We have the um, the uh, solar plexus chakra, which is um, uh, yellow, and that is very much for uh, the, uh, the 
the digestive system and the um, the psychic center. We have the um, sacral chakra, which is orange, and that is the physicality of the sexual organs, very much the womb for the woman, um, and that um, they're all so important for the development of the light body and the base chakra. Some people call this the root chakra. It's red. And this is the chakra of the physicality. Um, and the idea here is to get the chakras into balance so that they all match in size, that they're all spinning in correct flow. Um, and obviously you meet people and some of the chakras are shut down. I mean, most people on this planet, unfortunately, the crown chakra is just close off. The base chakra is too uh, big and it isn't really the right color. You find somebody who is spiritually aware, who's meditating and on a spiritual path, who is aware of um, moving into enlightenment and their crown chakra is lovely and developed. The base chakra is a great anchor to the earth, so they're fully grounded and fully awake and all the chakras in between are in balance. So this is just our, our energy system, our energy body. And um, to be able to, to see them and feel them and work with them is very positive because if your chakras are in alignment then the physical body will be in health and you work with everything together so if you um, want to activate the chakras through the physical body then good nutrition is important and we can go on then to you know pure water liquids um, and vice versa if the chakras um, are not looking so good and you completely quit junk food and start eating well then you'll create a good balance in the chakras. So you work with everything. You work holistically on all the levels and, and uh, that way you'll develop your chakras um, in balance. That's absolutely fascinating and I appreciate that you went through each one individually. Um, I understand the colors and I understand the placement and I have done uh, some vi uh, guided visualizations of chakra healing where I could actually see my chakras are out of line or blocked. I saw them as black uh, black marks. And um, although I wasn't aware of, like, which one I was looking at, I couldn't tell you which one it was, but I knew that there was blockages. And, um, and now when I do it, I can sense, like, where actually in my body, aortic body, the how far out they're out of line. They're sometimes not even within the body position. They're sometimes outside of the body position. So it's amazing, like, um, through different traumas that we've gone through through our childhood or through life or maybe even in our DNA that comes through from past lives or whatever, that all these things, the system is, is out of whack. And and can you maybe give us a, a, a little rundown of what we could do with you? Like, if somebody called you for help, um, what would be something that, that they could ask for that would help them get their system in alignment? Well, if I see um, a client, I ask for a photograph and then I can do photographic reading. If somebody called in, then I would look at their energy through their voice. Um, it would be difficult, I feel, to do a full uh, chakra reading in a short period of time. So what I would do if somebody called in would be to look at the energetic body as a whole because each chakra is connected to the energetic system, which is the aura. So I would look at the aura as a whole uh, rather than a thorough individual um, reading. If I had somebody who I had done a thorough reading for and some of the chakras were out of balance, then um, it would depend on which one uh, is out of balance as to how we would approach it. Crystals are wonderful and there are you can use crystals for each chakra, crystals that are in alignment with the color of the chakra. Um, if you want to activate the crown chakra, you can use quartz crystals, quartz crystals, the clear ones. They also can align the pineal gland. Um, the, the, indigo, the, the indigo color, the dark blue color, will also align the pineal gland. So you can meditate with crystals. You could lie down and meditate while you're lying on your back with crystals on each chakra. Um, you could go and have crystal healing from a crystal healer that knew about um, chakra balancing as well. Um, a visualization through meditation that you were talking about as well because 
even though crystals are a physical thing and it helps some people to actually have a physical uh, entity in front of them, the consciousness is also a physical entity. We just can't see it. It's just as powerful. And our own consciousness working on our own self is the most powerful entity for us because from the highest perspective, there is only us. There is only one individual here. So whoever is listening to me talk now... I would say to them, you are the only entity here. So your consciousness is the most powerful for you because that's all there is in your subjective reality. And from the highest perspective, that is the truth. We are all one, incarnated in different dimensions, different times. We're one soul. So meditation would be wonderful to visualize the chakras. Um, A a great exercise for now um, as we're moving into this shift period and with 2012 being such a significant year, um, what, one of the metaphors that I'm, I'm being given from the nine is that um, the chakras have been upgraded, as it were, bearing in mind that this is a metaphor and one of many metaphors. Um, our chakras haven't really changed as such. Um, we are changing the whole uh, energetics of Earth and the cosmos, and it is changing us. So from that perspective we could say the chakras are being upgraded so when you visualize the root chakra for example connecting to the earth um, for somebody who wants to go through this evolution process the shift that many are calling the ascension process um, one would visualize that the, the root chakra is anchored to the fifth dimensional earth rather than third dimensional earth. So we're using metaphor here to anchor ourselves to to beyond the shift or in the energy of the shift. So we would visualize the third dimensional earth as the old earth, the fifth dimensional earth as the new earth, and one can visualize the new earth as a paradise utopia kind of visualization with beautiful plants and a beautiful sun and all the love you can imagine. and anchor the, the root chakra when you do your anchoring process to that earth and anchor all the chakras to that earth. And when somebody has done these exercises spiritually, I can see that because I look at their chakras and they're upgraded. They look bigger, they spin faster, and they look brighter. And so that tells me that this person has been doing these exercises. All these spiritual exercises are actually working on your physical body. I know it's it's hard to believe that um, one can actually change the structure of the physical body on a cellular level simply by meditation. But this is what's happening, and I know that there are scientists out there that are in the process of kind of proving this now with their experimentation. I don't know if I could give you any names, but um, David Wilcock does that kind of research. So yeah. I'll throw his na- name in there if you wanted to research somebody who is. Uh, and then there's uh, Nassim Haramain who talks of um, somebody who the nine tell me he is one of the people that is presenting the unified field um, in a scientific way. So, you know, these these things are, are, are becoming proven depending on how you see proof. Um, There is a rationalizing element to this. There is a scientific uh, element to this. And it is difficult, I think, when people talk about angels and chakras and fairies and light bodies. Some people think, what is that, you know? And I think if you you want to um, help others and be the best way shower that you can be, it's really good to get some grounded terminology for those people who really get turned off when they hear words like ascension and and, and, uh, DNA activation and chakras, and they're just not there. So you can switch to the psychological, switch to the scientific, and then you can engage these people. When I speak to the nine, I say to them, why do I bring forward through you such new age terminology, Um, you know, ascension and light body and way showers. And do you know there are activation keys and codes within the words? So words like ascension, light body, DNA activation, murk of the vehicle, these are codes in the words that speak directly to the DNA and create activation. So if somebody is getting turned off by those words, then perhaps they're not ready yet to face that. But the fact that they've even heard the words somewhere is going in and it's activating them on some level. 
And if you just look around the youngsters now that are sort of browsing around YouTube and then happen to find some of these videos and and, and they, they might perhaps hear perhaps one of my videos and think, oh, that's all a bit weird. I'll turn that off. And then two weeks later, they're researching the the uh, conspiracy theories and they're looking yes. at um, uh -huh. the government system and the, and the economic system. They think that perhaps all of a sudden they have just they've just decided to do some research, but really. Those words, ascension, Nibiru, Nibiru, um, another one is uh, Magdala, Magdalene, um, the, you know, these words have gone in to the DNA and woken them up to wherever it is that their level of understanding is at that point, and then they're off on that journey, and it's just happening all over. Uh, it's even happening to those individuals in countries where they don't have the internet and they don't have YouTube. It's still happening on a, tel on a telepathic level and everything is going into the consciousness grid for everybody to access. So when you are working with your consciousness, you are able to change your body, the physical structure of your body at a cellular level and that's essentially what we are doing. Uh, I have to say, the outcome of that, um, the information I get from the nine here is nobody on this planet knows for sure exactly how this will manifest. Nobody has the absolute given manifested blueprint for how our bodies will change and what we will be and how the planet will be because it's in the process of being created. And there are so many timelines as to where we can go with this. Um, one of the greatest, um, I, I feel, uh, pieces of help, really, is to see everything as metaphor. So, therefore, you can always look beyond um, the literal and see if it's a metaphor. Everything is metaphor, even things that are, li are literal. Things there are, there are literal metaphors, including us. We're metaphors as well for something. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and that's a whole other issue, really. When you get messages come through, how do you know if they're literal? How do you know if they're metaphor? And that's a question I'm being asked right now from quite a lot of people, and I'm asking this question myself, and I've been talking to the Nine about that because I don't like to think that any of the messages I get that are potentially um, negative in an earth-changing way are literal. And I recently had a visualization, um, a message come forward about um, an earthquake, a twister in Kansas. And I saw this as a, a metaphor and that the whole um, Wizard of Oz Dorothy theme was coming at us right now and we're on the yellow brick road and there's this Wizard of Oz behind the curtain and that's the, the sort of Illuminati government and I had all that. And yet there really was a twister in Kansas two weeks after I got the message and I was a bit sort of, oh my goodness, that was literal. So I spoke to the nine and they say to me, and this is the, interesting thing that I got from them is when you get the message you don't know whether it's literal or metaphor because it can go either way and you can create it to be literal or metaphor so if you just sort of sit there and you're really angry with the system and full of hatred and you're getting messages then you're helping the negative to manifest but if you Absolutely. are moving with with yeah, if you're moving with a, a group. Sorry, are you losing yeah. me? No, oh, okay. I'm trying to say agree with you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, Go no, ahead. that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. I thought perhaps you couldn't hear. Um, so, yeah, if you get together with a group, that's why group meditation is so important. You can actually create the um, intended message to just manifest metaphorically rather than literally. And there are so many degrees of metaphor so it could be a metaphor within the emotional body of yourself or of humanity or of Earth, or it could be a metaphor within um, the, the spirituality or, or wherever it may go, you can direct it. I think that's got to be the most important thing. Having said that, obviously the Earth plays a part, and some, some of these um, clairvoyant precognitive messages you get will have to manifest in a physical sense due to balancing within the Earth. Um, but the best thing for us to do is always to um, err on the side of positive and work with love and, and trust. And, and um, I'm assured that if enough of us are doing that, then physical um, sort of destructive 
elements occurring will be minimal and in isolated pockets and not this great big global mass of destruction. Um, we're already at the point where there's enough of us that are um, creating that message into metaphoric energies rather than physical energies. We're already at the point of, uh, um, there's a word, uh, when, when you have a certain amount of people and you can actually influence, critical mass, that's it, sorry. So we're already there. Right. Uh, to a great point so uh, people you know like yourself and those that are getting together on blog talk radio getting together in spiritual communities getting together with spiritual websites doing daily meditations those people are doing this planet a huge huge service right now that's um, so true. And the people that are doing research, for one, is Lynn Taggart. She's doing the Consciousness Project with Princeton University in New Jersey. And the critical mass you talked about, um, I think it's like uh, the square root of 1% is enough to make the change. And also, I wanted to add, Michael Tessarian has done a lot of research uh, based on different psychiatrists or psychological researchers, namely Carl Jung who finds that what we're experiencing here is not what so much as what's going on outside of us, what we see in the physical world, but that we haven't cleared our own shadows. And as long as that we're um, blocking the, um, the light into our own shadows, that we're projecting that onto everything and everyone in the earth, in the earth plane. So people who haven't uh, come to grips with their own negativity and with the whole consciousness, the positive, the light, and the negative that exist in all people, that they're the ones that are uh, projecting this uh, devastation and whatever we see that's not positive. Um, it's kind of, it, it comes internally. It all comes from internally kind of adding to the conversation of what you're saying. Um, I always thought that was fascinating. He's one of the first people, after I got out of that political uh, realm and got moving into the spiritual, where he talks a lot about that. Um, he also works with uh, Jordan Maxwell. I don't know, but he, he's more into the conspiracy um, theory, uh, and I think he's a little bit on the negative side. He has a lot of fear. So I think that comes out a lot in his messages, although his information is, like you say, spot on. He, you know, nobody can argue with the things that he's presented. But I think at, on a, a personal level that you can sense the fear within him. And um, I think that's what Michael Tessarian's kind of talking about. If we haven't cleared ourselves uh, emotionally, that we can't really reflect positive into the cosmos, that love and lightness that um, that is within all of us. So um, if you don't have anything to add with that, um, we can go on to the pineal gland, which I think um, we have about 20 minutes remaining before the end of our session. And um, what I'd like to ask you is that um, I've been working extensively since last October on distilled liquids, um, urine therapy, and the effects of uh, fluoride and other um, inorganic minerals on the pineal gland and the body in general. And you had done a video, which was, I believe, about the ascension, where you briefly talked about the pineal gland and things that would help to clear it. So if you'd like to share a little bit about that, um, we can go on from there, or anything you'd like to talk about, Magenta. Okay. Well, just following on from what you were saying um, about some people that are, you know, into conspiracy theory um, and have a bit of fear, um, I would just like to say that, you know, we each have our role to play. And there are many within the conspiracy theory movement, there is truth there. And there are those who are actually opening our eyes to truth. And it's just the way that that those, those, that information is perceived, if it's perceived with fear and anger, which is only natural at first. And it's actually okay as part of our process to feel, you know, the anger and fear at first. The problem is if we stay there. If we stay there for months and months and months and years and years and years in a state of anger and fear, that isn't going to be good for us, for our soul, for the ascension process or anything. But to move through that briefly and then sort of carry on with the research and 
then discover the people that are actually doing something about it, um, then obviously that's that's the way forward to sort of go through that. So we each have our roles to play, and I have great respect for anybody really who's out there awakening people um, in whatever way that they're doing it. Um, but regarding the pineal gland um yeah when you asked me to speak on this subject i have to say i i don't feel i've really got that much information uh particularly um but uh, i have got information from the nine about the pineal gland um i've always known about the well for many years i've known about the third eye and the importance of the third eye i didn't realize that there was actually a gland in our um brains a little tiny gland in our brains that is actually a physical gland and um i i actually heard um david wilcox speak about this and he was saying that research has been done on the pineal gland when it's been sort of um looked at scientifically di dissected there are tiny little um that's horrible, doesn't it? Dissected pineal gland. Um, there's tiny little sort of optic nerves inside the pineal gland. So it really is an eye, and tiny little sort of um, uh, little tiny elements to the pineal gland. That's like the inner ear. So it's like a, a real ear, a real eye. It provides real sound and real sight, but obviously it's buried inside the brain. And the nine adding to that have told me that there are a little tiny crystals inside the pineal gland. I haven't actually heard anyone else say this or read it anywhere, but this is from the nine. And these tiny, tiny crystals um, empower the fluid inside the um, pineal gland. And then these little sort of optic nerves and these little uh, nerves that are like the, the ear um, give us our um, true inner sound of light, the... the, the um, the sound of light that we hear. We hear this when we're in our dream time, especially if we're in astral projection or out-of-body experiences. You can often find, if you speak to somebody who does a lot of OBEs and astral projection, they'll say to you, the vivid scenery and the color that I witness when I'm in an OBE is more vivid and more vibrant than it is in the waking state. And I know many people say that, and I myself have experienced this. It's truly marvelous. Well, that's your pineal gland that is, is showing you the sight. Yes, it is an eye. Yes, it is an ear. And it gives you the, the true inner sight of, of absolute beauty and color. Um, it is our connection um, to the higher uh, uh, dimensions. So it is an inner eye. So the third eye chakra is the chakra that represents this, this pineal gland. It can be activated by spiritual exercises, by meditation, by kundalini raising. And the thing is, when it comes to fluoride and, and, and other um, chemicals like that, the those in the know, the sort of powers that be, or I like to call them the powers that were, um, Illuminati, Dark <laughs> Cabal, you know, dark worker, dark masters, whatever you wish to call them. You know, these are sort of shadow government groups of elite individuals who've actually incarnated down bloodlines and um, uh, taken the children from birth and raised them in this um, this, this this way that, that, that they that they raise them in this sort of uh, opposite to where we are, service to self um, frequency. They've known about this pineal gland. They've also known that there will come a time on earth when there will be an activation. And they want to make sure that their place is secure in this new earth. Some of them are actually preventing the... Um, the ascension into this sort of golden age uh, they wish to steer the timelines of earth in a different direction but bearing in mind we've got factions that are at loggerheads with each other that all want different things they're a pyramid structure and they are not in unity they are divided so that's where their weakness is because they're divided they chose to divide us and they knew that the only way they could really control the people uh, who are consisting of, you know, reincarnated Atlanteans, reincarnated North American Indian people, you know, wise ones, ancient ones, ascended masters, fairies from the elemental realm and angels. They know that when they're in human form, they are subject to the human laws. Therefore, it's divide is the, the way that they do this and shut us down. So we're easy to control. One way of doing this is to shut off the psychic center so that we can't awaken to the truth. Once we do awaken to that inner truth, we can find out the answers to everything. When we've got a good connection with the higher self, 
and the ET presence, the ascended masters, whichever frequency comes to us, we can learn everything that there is to know. And they want, they wish to prevent this because once we learn everything that there is to know, we'll start being told about the fact that we can change our bodies at the cellular level and then we'll all get together and collectively create the reality that, that they know that they will be they won't be able to be have power in so they're trying to prevent it it's not happening as you can clearly see but some of them think that they are still in control others have kind of know that they've lost the game we've got a lot of uh, people out there so one thing they've done is target the pineal gland and um fluoride is one chemical that can create calcification within the body um and so their agenda is to sort of say that fluoride is um, essential for our teeth and they try and get it in our water supply. And if you've got little, lovely little starseed children incarnating from higher dimensions, the best thing that they want to do is shut their pineal gland down from birth, so get fluoride in the in the water straight away so that the babies are drinking it and and hopefully shut everyone down. That's, that's one of their agendas. And, of course... Um, it will have worked to a certain degree because obviously there are a lot of people out there that have consumed fluoride and it, they will be feeling the effects from it. Um, but there is never um, a, a, an ending of anything. Just because somebody's been consuming fluoride since the day they were born till the age of, say, 50, doesn't mean that they can't reactivate the pineal gland. There are some people who have been consuming fluoride their whole lives and they are so developed that it hasn't actually decalcified their pineal gland. And these are the people who will say to you, well, I've been drinking fluoride in my water, but I'm still getting loads of visions. I'm still having OBEs. It hasn't worked on those people, but it has worked on others. So obviously we want to do everything we can to cleanse ourselves and to keep our pineal gland in tip-top working condition. So um, there are ways that we can work on decalcifying that pineal gland and um, quitting fluoride is, is one top of the list really make sure that I think a little bit of natural fluoride that's sort of in the land is okay it's this man-made chemical fluoride that is uh, such a, a danger to our pineal glands um, so you know brush your teeth with fluoride free toothpaste there's some great toothpaste out there made with all sorts of wonderful homeopathic and herbal um uh things and you know my son is 15 years old he's been brushing his teeth with um fluoride free toothpaste now since he was four and a half and um took him to the dentist the other day and he has perfect teeth no sign of decay no sign of plaque and the dentist is completely um, baffled when I repeatedly tell him, you know, no, he does not use fluoride toothpaste. He was four and a half. So, you know, that's just my own personal um, story. Um, the, these toothpastes are great, and I use them, and um, they they will work safely with your teeth if you do some research into the type of toothpaste you're using. So you quit fluoride there, but it's more important um, regarding the water because obviously even if you are using fluoride toothpaste that might not actually be enough to, decal to actually calcify the pineal gland you're not really swallowing your toothpaste that isn't really the greatest danger the greatest danger here is um, oh, somebody in the chat room saying what toothpaste over here in the UK if you go to the health shop there's lots of non-fluoride you know fluoride free toothpaste um, uh, there are all sorts of, of makes um, and you just have to read the sort of packet they're so expensive that's why it's it's so funny when the government say that um, poor people can't afford fluoride toothpaste and it's such a silly joke really that they can get away with saying this because you can get fluoride toothpaste in our shops in the UK for sort of 18p which is like I don't know a dollar <laughs> and yet you'd, you'd be paying £3.50 to £4 which is like eight dollars for fluoride free toothpaste so their uh -huh. their sort of logic doesn't add up there at all and i've never met anyone no matter how poor they are that isn't buying toothpaste for their children you know um everyone is buying toothpaste so it's the poorer children that are getting too much fluoride it's those that have more awareness and more education and those that are linked in and connected that are learning these things that are going out and, and buying the fluoride free so the water, if you have fluoride in your water, if your water is fluoridated, then you need to look at a way to be consuming water that's fluoride-free. 
I know that there are some filters that you can get to attach to your um, house. Um, I, I realize that would be an expensive job, but I know that there are some water filtration systems out there that are absolutely wonderful for uh, changing the water flow. Now, the nine have always spoken to me. You, I know you've mentioned distilled liquids. They haven't really told me that much about distilled water as such, but what they've spoken about is pure water. They don't have to tell me what pure water is. They haven't actually said, oh, it's spring water or it's mineral water or it's tap water. That's where I have to do the research myself. But then they'll tell me, yes, I'm correct if I present a water to them. What they mean by pure water is water that is free of added extras that man has put in and free from harmful chemicals. That pure water is like a blank CD. It's, it's waiting for um, an imprint to be put into it. So if you can get a water filtration system on your house, you can actually get some of them that have got little crystals right through the pipes. I know David Wolf, um, the raw food uh, nutritionist, who I think is mm -hmm. absolutely wa wonderful, uh, David Wolf, um, he talks about this. I think he's had this fitted to his um, uh, house. I don't know that much about the actual um, logistics of the system, but I know that the nine tell me that if there are crystals in the water and if you can create the water to spin in a certain way, then you are okay. changing the consciousness of the water because water is a living consciousness. Now, the stuff that's in our tap water is so harmful to the living consciousness of the water so that by the time you are drinking it, it's predominantly no longer living. There will be some living elements to it, but um, it isn't going to be as living as water that's gone through this spin, this geometric spin, and, and had crystals in it. But you can create this yourself in a, in a sort of cheaper way. I'm not sure if there are any filters out there that will filter fluoride out of your water, like the little water filters you can buy. I know that they can filter out all sorts of nasty chemicals. I, I use one. I, I don't know if it works for fluoride. There may be some, so that's something to research. I'm getting from the nine that, yes, that they are out there. So, you know, that would be good to look for. Um, but if you put crystals, if you can empower the crystals, cleanse them first, empower them with your um, intention or your spell or your visualization or your your chant or however you wish to empower your crystal. You can put crystals into your water. So leave, leave empowered crystals in a jug of water. Don't use plastic because that, again, is um, um, a harmful substance to the water. Try and get it into a nice, nice earthenware jug or, or um, brass or glass and let your water sit in the crystals. Water will then take on the chemical um, structure, the energetic structure of the crystals. So when you drink the water, you are drinking the energetic of the crystal that you empowered the crystal with. So this could be anything. You could be love would be a really good one. So you're you're drinking love water. Another way you can do this is to actually stick little labels on the glass jug that the water's in and write love, bliss, uh, happiness, empowerment, divine feminine, higher consciousness, light body, and you empower the vibration of the words with the water. The reason why distilled water is so um, high on the list of pure waters is because it is um, a blank page, as it were. It's, it's a blank CD, so it can be empowered uh -huh. very, very easily. Uh, with the crystals or with the intention or just by singing to it or talking to it, meditating on it, however you wish to do it. Um, so if you're using filtered uh, water out of the tap, it, it's not going to be as much of a blank page as the distilled water. Distilled water will really take on your vibration. Um, I do know that there are some uh, nutritional ways of thinking that would teach that distilled water should only be drunk for a short period of time. It's very cleansing and it's good for, you know, getting the body into balance, getting into a cleansing situation. But once the body's in balance, to not continue to take it. There are other schools of thought that do not agree with that and feel that distilled water can be safely consumed for the rest of your life. I feel that perhaps 
each individual person should look into this themselves to see what's right for them. But on a global level, I, I feel the nine would probably um, go along with the first, the second one, where it is safe to drink for, for the rest of your life. Urine is a whole other issue, isn't it? I mean, when you talk about drinking your own urine, I think most people are going to instantly have a, a gag response and think, oh my goodness, how disgusting. And we've always been taught that urine is a waste product and how revolting. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> our own body is, 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 a, is a distiller. And yeah. what water is the most purest um, water, the safest water, and what water can the darker... Um, Illuminati groups not patent they can't sell it well they can they they are actually selling it but but they can't sell yours that you're passing you know that's yours (laughs) and so um, that is is, is distilled liquid itself and I do um, know a lot about urine therapy from my own personal research and also um, from the information that the nine tell me about and I see we're getting to the end of the hour but don't worry I can I can stay on for a little bit because I would like to share this information. Um, how I first learned about urine therapy, um, about four years ago, um, I had um, a, a cervical smear test done and it came back um, that there were uh, precancerous changes um, in my cervix that were quite severe. In fact, the doctor told me if I didn't have a hysterectomy um, that I would have full-blown cervical cancer within a year. And they wanted me in by the end of the week for the operation. But my intuition was not in alignment with this. And I asked for six months and to repeat the smear test. And I wanted some time to research this. The doctors weren't happy about that at all, but that's what I did. And I went on a a complete sort of um, uh, vision of of research. Uh, And I researched everything I could possibly get my hands on regarding cancer and cervical cancer in particular and one of the um, therapies I stumbled upon was urine therapy obviously I'm in in, uh, talks with the nine every step of the way but the nine do teach me to do my own research as well as communicate with them so it's it's a balance between your own research and your intuition always Um, although some people can rely totally on their intuition and still have all the information they want I'm one of these that does like to back things up with research. And when I first um, uh, heard about urine therapy, and I, I, I um, know that this, this is going back for years and years and years, that people were using their urine to um, empower themselves for spiritual reasons and also for healing reasons. Um, but I still wasn't happy. I wanted to um, look at every single compound in urine and research each one individually and this is what I did I I looked for every compound you can do this anyone listening to this now you can go out and do this Google is all it takes I researched every compound in urine and I then researched each compound individually and not one compound is damaging or is negative or is a waste product in fact everything can be purchased in a health shop it's all um, hormones and salts and urea and water and I'm thinking, okay, there's nothing in here that's, that's bad. And I'm getting, you know, positive feedback here from the nine. So when I felt that I'd done my research, um, then I felt ready to actually try the process. And so I did. I used urine therapy in conjunction with um, lots of other therapies as well. And it didn't take me six months. I was still having quite bad smear results for six months. But after two years... Um, and still insisting no hysterectomy, and I'm doing this myself, because I knew, I knew inside that I would do it. I knew I would. And they were telling me, you know, this is a really severe form of precancer, and it's glandular, and it's very fast-growing, and your immune system can't possibly fight it off. But, you know, I looked at every option, nutrition and everything, and I got the all clear after two years. Um, And urine therapy was part of my healing package, I've since spoken to the nine um, about the more uh, spiritual side of of urine um, practice um, because obviously that wasn't something I looked into as deeply while I was using it for healing. It was more about the physiological uh, and biological 
uh, compounds within urine that I was looking at. But I have spoken to the nine about urine therapy, and that's um, the video that I have on YouTube about this. There is um, a downside to this because if you are um, taking medicines of any kind, orthodox medicines, you will recycle that medicine in your urine if you if you drink it. Um, and if your nutrition is bad, for example, when I first started, I was drinking a lot of coffee. And <laughs> this is pretty horrible, but, you know, the, the urine tasted absolutely mm-hmm. awful. Absolutely, and yes, absolutely. It's <laughs> revolting, you know. So when I quit coffee... You see, when you're when you're in a good state with your nutrition, your urine will not taste foul. It will not taste bad. I know that's hard to believe. It's an acquired taste and it is unfamiliar, but it it's not that bad when your body is is in a pure state with the foods and the liquids you are consuming. And so when my nutrition was good and I was quitting the caffeine and everything, then, you know, things were different. And you can see if your urine is a dark color or it's cloudy, you know, there's there's an issue. Your urine should be pale yellow and sometimes it can even be clear. So um, it depends on the person. Um, but from a spiritual level, the nine were talking about activated urine. These are the people that have obviously light within the body. So these people are working nutritionally and they are working psychically and spiritually. They're doing spiritual exercises. They're they're doing yoga, meditation. They're working with their consciousness and they're working on the nutrition as well. These people are creating light within their bodies and all their cells because each one of our cells is made of light ultimately um, and these people have got activated pineal glands and the crystals in there are working. So the urine of these people is extremely valuable um, liquid. Um, and it's a shame to just sort of let it all go down the toilet, really, because it's it's magical. And it will connect you to the geometry of the sacred circle. Because what you are doing is creating a circle. When you drink your urine and you let it pass out of you, you're alive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when you drink it, you loop yourself back energetically and you are a circle. It's like that sacred symbol of the snake eating its tail. I think it's called an, a uberos or something like that. It's probably pronounced wrong. Or a boris. Or a boris. That's it. That's, that's the one. That's the one. This is what you become. You are going full circle. And when you do this, this creates a circle within your life. You create circles in your life. So magic starts to happen in your reality. So you're working with the law of attraction. You are you are living your life in harmony with the geometry of the universe. And these circles can be noticed. For example, you start a new job on the 20th of December, and then the 20th of December the following year, you'll have something new. And then the 20th of December, maybe 10 years later, you loop a circle. Your birthday is a circle, and you start to find that your birthdays are no longer days where you just get a bit of cake, get drunk, and have a, have a load of presents. Your birthday becomes a sacred circle, and things start happening for you on your solar return. So if you're doing the same thing when you consume your urine. You are looping at that, that back to you. This creates spin in the DNA. And when you have spin in your DNA, this is when the um, out-of-body experiences can occur. You can get into the astral body. You can explore the astral realms. This is when the astral realms become of a higher vibration. So you're not sort of shooting into the lower realms. You're up in the higher places. You can speak to the most wonderful beings, these gurus, these ascended masters, you can just find them. You can come straight out of your body, into your bedroom, go straight out of the window, call a portal, get on the portal, say the word of the place you want to go or say the name of the guru or the ascended master you want to see, come out the portal the other end, there's the ascended master, sit down with him, ask him anything you want to know. And when you come out of your um, dream time, your OBE, and you remember everything, you know, it's it's fantastic, profound experience. And it makes you happy all day long because you're thinking, wow, did I meet some amazing master last night? And, you know, and it, it will be about your life. It will be about your future. It will be the answer to your problems. It will be about your health. It will be about your ascension. It will be planetary. It will be global. Anything you want to know. And so, you know, urine therapy is a key to that. 
it activates the light body, activates the Merkaba, which is the um, shift in geometry uh, that contains the circle. The Merkaba is your vehicle of flight. And so I would say to anyone who wishes to um, look into urine therapy, my advice would be look at the energetics, look at the spiritual aspect of it, see if it fits you, see if you resonate. And look at the biological aspects as well. Go research the compounds in urine. I mean, I can tell you now um, that um, the, the powers that be or the powers that work, they know the, um, in, uh, how important urine is. And I, uh, I know that um, a few years ago, um, one of the pharmaceutical companies went into business with um, Porta Potty. It was in America, in the USA, not here mm -hmm. in the UK. So... Sorry about that, all you people who've been camping and, and, and donated a sample <laughs> into Porta Potty, but that, that sample of yours has ended up in somebody's heart medicine. And if you, re if you research urokinase, it's actually the result of Porta Potty and this pharmaceutical company going into business. And they had a filter in the, port in, in the little Porta Potty, the little camping toilet, where your urine would be caught into some kind of um, sterile machine or whatever, and it's been patented as a medicine and it works i mean it's been helping people um although it's far better to drink your own urine if you have a heart problem than mm -hmm. take your knees, which is a patented mm -hmm. um medicine that will cost you lots of money and the pharmaceutical companies who are all in the in bed with the Illuminati or whatever, they're the ones that are getting the money. And the other one that's sort of more close to home for a lot of women is um, uh, hormone replacement therapy. I mean, you know, so many women are on this. You know, they'll, they'll go, go into the menopause and feel that they're getting, oh, dear, it's the menopause, I'm getting hot flushes. What do you do then, Sue? You know, oh, I took hormone replacement therapy. Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard of that. Everyone takes it. So off they go, see their doctor. Yeah, here's your prescription. But not once do they ever ask what's in it. What is in it? It's mare's urine. It is the urine from okay. a female horse. And they take female horses and they lock them up and they put this little sort of receptacle around their you know, bladder area, and these poor horses have to drink, 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 and pee, 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 and they're making money out of these horses that have no life. Now, surely it's better for a woman who's going into menopause and isn't feeling that she's coping with it. Well, drink your own urine, but make sure your nutrition is good first. Make sure your consciousness is in the right place. If you are riddled with fear, that's going to be in your urine. If you're feeling love and joy and you are working as a way shower and you're working towards the ascension, that's going to be in your urine. So why not recycle it? I mean, I don't do it anymore, um, but it is something I would do um, in the future when I feel the time is right for me personally to do so. And I, I would definitely give the information to others about urine as a distilled liquid. Um, so at least people can make up their own minds. That's what it's all about, you know, because some people might think, oh, my goodness, this is... Um, this doesn't sound right for me, and that's fine, but at least people have the information. So, yes, it's already being patented from horses and from these American campers. <laughs> so, uh -huh. uh, Absolutely. The, the, other, the other distilled liquid I would mention is rainwater. And, of course, we have a problem here as well because, obviously, our skies are not... Um, clear with all the chemtrails and everything but again the powers that be are aware of rainwater properties so there there will be some places on earth where chemtrails haven't been deliberately sprayed i don't know where these places are um, i also know that the rainforest um the, the rainforests that in, are in a natural state that have not been infiltrated will provide um distilled water in some areas but again that would need to be intuited and researched because um some of the rainwater there can be uh a, what's the word a, have radiation in it so that Absolutely. rainwater is an, another another issue so one would have to intuit but another thing the nine told me some people somewhere and i've never read this i only know this from the nine and i don't know who these people are It'd be lovely to find confirmation of this some people somewhere on this planet have created a device. Um, it is some kind of free energy. It does have some kind of spiraling coil in it, and it's a pyramid kind of thing, and it's got crystals in it. And it empowers what goes in it. And there's some kind of device that can catch the rainwater and strip out the damage. 
and bring it back to its original form, kind of like a distiller. Uh, but this is information from the nine, and I, I don't have any confirmation of that. But there, there are free energy devices that some people are creating now um, themselves. People are going into dream states and meditation, and they're picking up the blueprints for free energy devices, and they're creating them, and they're using them. So... Uh, um, even if powers that be aren't telling us about the free energy devices that they have, there are star seeds and, uh, and indigo individuals and crystal individuals out there that are making their own and keeping it hidden. And there'll come a time when these come to light. So there's always a back door. Whatever the Illuminati groups shut down, the light will open up. There's always a back door for everything. So. That was wonderful. I I don't even know how to tell you. You know almost as much as I do about distilled liquids, <laughs> and you're in therapy. Oh, do that. I? That was brilliant.